Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kim Polese, and I am delighted to be here representing the Board of Directors of the Public Policy Institute of California. And we're very pleased today to present this program featuring University of California President Mark Udoff. Welcome, Mark. We're delighted to have you here. And I'd like to first, thank by, first start by thanking the sponsors of this series. This is the speaker series on California's future, and we have some wonderful sponsors, which I would like to mention. And they include the Applied Materials Foundation, the California Endowment, the James Irvine Foundation, the Nicholas Bergruen Institute on Governance, the Pacific Life Foundation, S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the Sierra Health Foundation, Southern California Edison, the Stewart Foundation, Union Bank, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and knowledge partner McKinsey and & Company. And this series is also funded by the PPIC Donor Circle. Before we begin, two housekeeping issues. First, there is a confidential survey in your packet of information. If you would please take a moment to fill that out and leave it behind at the registra registration desk as you leave, we would greatly appreciate it. And second, please silence your cell phones. And now, on to the program. To set the context for the conversation between President Udoff and PPIC President and CEO Mark Baldessare, we will first hear from Hans Johnson about the state of higher education in California. Hans is a Bren Fellow here at PPIC and the co-director of research and a nationally recognized demographer who's an author of influential papers on higher education and workforce issues. And I invite you to read more about Hans's background in your program. Welcome, Hans. Th thanks, Kim. So, so I have two very important statistics that I want you to remember. The first one is one million, and the second one is 82 cents. And of course, I'm going to explain uh, where I got these statistics from in a minute. PPIC has done a series of studies that we call California 2025. And just as the name implies, the focus of those studies has been on California's long-term demographic and economic future. And in doing those studies, one area stood out to us as perhaps the greatest impediment to future success in our state. And that is something we call the workforce skills gap. And specifically, what I mean by that is our economy continues to demand more highly educated workers, and yet our population and higher education institutions are not changing in ways that will keep up with that demand. Indeed, in California, we have the first generation ever in which young adults are less likely to have graduated from college than their parents' generation. And in fact, the most highly educated cohort in California are people between the ages of 60 to 64, with a greater percentage of them graduating from college than any other cohort. Now, of course, that cohort is going to retire, and that will lead to a shortage of college graduates. Our projections suggest that by 2025, and here comes the first statistic, California will fall one million college graduates short of where we need to be compared to where our economic demand will be. Now, clearly, it is in all of our interest to close that gap. PPIC has embarked on a series of studies uh, in higher education that have showed how we could close the gap. Our focus in all of that work is on what is best for Californians, what is best for the students of the state, and what is best for the economy of our state. And broadly, we've identified three fairly simple prescriptions. One, the state needs to establish new goals to increase the number of college students and the number of college graduates in our state. Second, the state needs to find funding to match those goals. I didn't say they were easy prescriptions. And third, uh, the state needs to be smart about its funding. We need to use data and information so that we can determine what works best and what doesn't work and so that we can be efficient about the higher education dollars that we spend. Now, we've also conducted a series of studies to examine, what, to examine the most significant public policy intervention in higher education in California over the last 10 years or so. And that uh, most dramatic policy intervention has actually been a defunding of higher education. California's priorities have changed, not as the result of a deliberative process but as a consequence of putting out annual budget fires, with this latest year being perhaps a very nice exception. 
Ten years ago, for every general fund dollar that went to corrections, $1.89 went to UC, CSU, and the community colleges. In 2011-12, for every corrections dollar, and here comes your second statistic, the state spent 82 cents on UC, CSU, and the community colleges. We now spend more on corrections than we do on our higher education institutions, and that ratio has fallen by over half in this time frame. Adjusted for inflation on a per student basis, the state general fund contribution to UC and CSU is lower now than at any time in the past four decades. Now we've done a series of studies looking at this major public policy change. And as you can imagine, the effect on UC, CSU, and the community colleges is not good. Our primary finding is that we are serving fewer students than we should be serving. And we have not enough students graduating from our colleges to satisfy this workforce demand. Now, our purpose in all of this work is not to be doom and gloom. Uh, it is to make clear that the effect of fiscal and policy decisions in our state have consequences. And if we don't like the outcome of those decisions, we can change them. And there is a bit of good news. The most recent budget, uh, as proposed by the governor, restores some of the cuts to our higher education systems and perhaps puts us on a new road. The long history of California is one in which educational progress and economic progress have gone hand in hand. And with the right information and the right policies, we can return to that path. Now I would like to welcome uh, President Utoff and have both uh, the President and Mark uh, come to the stage for their discussion. Welcome, President Utoff. Um, let me just say a few words of introduction. Most of you know. President, thank you all for, for being here today. Um, President uh, Udoff arrived in California in 2008 and has uh, served as our president for five years. Uh, before that, he was uh, the head of the um, systems in uh, both the University of Texas and the University of Minnesota. So uh, for quite a while, he has been in a position of leadership in uh, higher education in this country. And um, he announced in August that he is going, that he will step down in August as, uh, as president of the UC. Uh, it's a privilege to share the stage with you. I will consider myself the other Mark on the stage here today. <coughs> because, uh, you have had such a distinguished uh, career. And um, thank you. I'd like to start our conversation with the question that we posed to you a while ago that uh, um, I think Hans has provided some good background for that question, and that is, uh, what do you think the biggest challenges are today for the higher education systems in California? Okay, well, th there are many of them, uh, and I'll <clears throat> try to go through a few of them. One, of course, is financial. Uh, the university uh, budget was reduced $860 million under uh, Governor Brown's proposal, which we certainly appreciate very much, uh, we would recoup about 150, but there's a million of that. So there's been a <clears throat> significant disinvestment in the universities, and that's true across the country. And we could talk about why is that, but um, 38 of the 50 states have had uh, pretty massive reductions in higher education. So there's a financial challenge. Uh, there's the challenge that a majority of all our young people are Latinos, and they're as deserving as any other population in the history of this state. And the question is, how are we going to afford them the opportunities that they need? And uh, we do a pretty good job, not perfect, but uh, we have a very high percentage of low-income students. We have more low-income students at Berkeley or Davis or UCLA than is, exist in the whole Ivy League. Uh, about 40% of our students are Pell Grant eligible forty-five or fifty thousand dollars a year in income or lower. So um, the challenges are the numbers. We probably should enroll thirty thousand more students than we do and we're not enrolling them. That would help with some of the goals that you've outlined, Mark. The challenges are financial uh, and then we have the typical challenges of management and how do we save money and how can we be more efficient and how can we work smarter and spend less on our cell phones and, 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 and so forth. All of those things are, are challenges. Um, this is the greatest public university system in the world. 
I mean, we have 60 Nobel laureates, more than whole countries. There are more uh, National Academy members at Berkeley than in the whole state of Texas. Um, these people, good times or bad, find it rather easy to get jobs. It's one phone call away. And so the question of how we retain that research uh, aspect of the university, five and a half billion dollars in research, 2.5 billion from the state of California out of a $23 billion budget. So those are important. And then there's one other thing I wanted to mention, and this is, I can say this, I've been in this business a very long time. I mean, I was uh, on the periphery of the Serrano lawsuit in California and the school finance in the United States Supreme Court and all sorts of civil rights-y sort of issues in the 70s, uh, a book called Gender Justice. <clears throat> the name of the game has changed. In, for much of a post-World War II era, education was a civil rights issue. How come African Americans are so underrepresented in higher education? Why aren't there more women who are whatever, law school deans or law students, medical students? Why are Asian Americans underrepresented? I could go down a, a whole list, but it was always assumed that what was, they, they saw it was worthwhile. The problem was one of exclusion and underrepresentation and discrimination and all that. Now you have people saying, you know, we don't think you need a degree. You have one entrepreneur who says, I'll give you $100,000 if you choose not to get a degree. I think he has a Princeton degree. Um, uh, I know a kid who got a PhD from Chicago who drives a taxi cab. Um, and we could go on and on. And, and that, so the debate is somewhat different now. One part of the debate is really how worthwhile is it? And that's a discussion the country is going to need to have. I'm biased. I think I would rather have my child with a college degree because the unemployment rate's four and a half percent rather than seven and a half percent, even if they don't, he or she doesn't have the perfect job. That's my opinion. But we need to work on that. And the other thing is the financial model. Historically, there's a book, famous book called The Cost Disease by William Baumel about essentially about education and health care, about why their costs go up. And essentially, it's because they're so labor intensive. But historically, you add 20 students, you add one professor. So much of a rec field and so much in the admissions office and financial aid and all the rest of it. Um, uh, the people of this country don't seem to have much um, fortitude to pay the bill. They want the same quality, they want more kids, better access, but appropriations, their put, money is, if you will, it's going into a, a locked box of Social Security, it's going into... Obamacare, and I'm not against any of those things. I'm just telling you that's, that, that's the picture. So um, uh, we need to figure out, is there an alternative educational delivery model? Does that involve e-learning and MOOCs or larger classes? But the model of, of sort of you add 1,000 students and therefore you add whatever, uh, 40 or 50 professors, um, the nation seems to be moving against that, and the families are beginning to rebel at the tuition levels. And I'm sort of sympathetic, coming from a blue-collar family. I do think it's, I'll be honest, when you charge $12,000 a year and you systematically discount it down to 8000 because that's what we give in financial aid, I wish it were lower, but it's not the end of the world. Our students graduate with $19,000 in debt, not $100,000. But all I'm saying is the middle class is, is openly questioning these high tuition levels, which includes $12,000 at UC and maybe 55000 at NYU or whatever. So how are we going to do this? And so I think maybe it's, it's an era that could be like the printing press era in a way. What is the technologies? What will be their role? Is it possible to use them and maintain the quality? How can you expand what we do and, and not have the bill go up? Mm. Those are the issues of the time. That's good. Good. Uh, last time you and I had lunch together was about a year, a year ago. Um, and I'm wondering what's changed in the conversation about higher ed if you think back to where we were, what we were talking about a year ago, and, and where we are today. Is it mostly the same, or is it different as a result of changing economy and, and budget situation? Well, it's mostly the same. Uh, I mean, it's... You know, most conversations of any um, 
importance can be traced to Aristotle or something like that. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, you know, so mostly it's the same, but I'd say there are a couple of things. One is people are taking a good look at the financial aid system, which I happen to think is broken also. It's not protective of enough of the middle class. I think we need to look at what the Australians and the Brits are doing to have um, uh, maybe a, a huge majority of students not paying tuition when they're there, but some sort of uh, repayment scheme, which is income adjusted. And we proposed that in Washington. So that's part, that's more in the ether now. I think the faculty is more receptive on online learning. I mean, I started our initiative in 2010, and frankly, I had a fair amount of resistance, a lot of sand in the gears. Uh, and, um, and I think uh, even though there continue to be rough spots, we're making a lot of progress. The faculty uh, opinion, I think, has progressed some. Um, but it's a big part of the conversation. Uh, during my first four years here, the governor didn't sit next to me at board meetings. Uh, that's been a big change in my life, uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know Governor Brown is intelligent and quick and uh, has lots of questions. Um, I don't know beyond beyond that. I, I'm really not sure. Some of these bills that are pending on um, e-learning and the like. I think the legislators legislature has gotten into it more. Yeah, let's talk than about perhaps that. Perhaps it should. Let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, the governor and the legislature. You alluded to both. Um, have seemed to have gotten very interested in higher education compared to what, at least what I've seen, you right. know, um, over the last few years. Um, a lot of discussions now about completion rates and transfer rates right. and freezing student fees. And um, so how do you, what do you do with that energy now that's coming out of the governor and governor's office and, and out of the legislative branch of government? And do they... Are there any ideas that have come forward there that you think are going to move us to the next level in higher education? Well, I don't see the New Jerusalem around the corner, but um, uh, yeah, I think it's healthy. I mean, it's engaged. And, um, you know, the, the truth is we need stability. And you can't freeze tuition forever. We're freezing it two years, last year and next year. But eventually you need modest, moderate tuition increases and modest, moderate increases in appropriations and you need to raise more money and so forth so you're more on an even even keel so I think basically it's it's a constructive conversation um, but the one thing I always caution is, is them is there's no such thing as a simplistic solution you know if our professor did, did nothing but teach it's easy to have them teach more but they bring in twice as much money on the research side and occasionally one of you might benefit from the cancer research or the alternative energy research, or you might enjoy the strawberries from Davis. Um, and um, so that's, it's a multidimensional institution. You can't just yank one thing out and, and, and say, I'm just going to pretend the rest of it doesn't exist. So I think the, the, the um, e-learning thing is very healthy. My own view is in the short run, it will not save us a lot of money, but in the long run, it might very well. Someone said, what's the difference between being in the 500th seat in the psych class and being online? Maybe there's not much difference, and maybe you can get it right and so forth. And maybe 10% of the courses should be online and reduce your marginal cost. So there's a lot of energy, but um, uh, too often it's directed at one issue. And what I try to do, and I, I have a very good relationship with the governor, the speaker, the pro tem, is to try to give them a sense of the complexity of the university. And... Um, and, and, and by and large, they listen, I have to say. And uh, so I, I actually, in some ways, I do appreciate the, the mm -hmm. attention because I think, you know, that's the beginning of an understanding and, and moving things ahead. They've also been very interested in accountability, and I'm very interested in accountability. When I arrived, it did, we did the first accountability report in the history of the University of California, and we put it online. Um, and I discovered there's no better way to keep a secret from the legislature <laughs> than to put it online. <laughs> no one ever I looks. I could have told you that. No one ever looks. <laughs> and there it is, you know, I, you know, they asked me a question, I could say, I don't, it's on page 17. And not only aren't we covering it up, it's been there forever, that data. And um, so, but anyhow, the, uh, the governor uh, and, and others in the legislature, they want some accountability and I'm for it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but it has to be feasible, it has to be practical. So what would I hold us accountable for? Graduation rates. Hmm. 
The biggest loss in America is when you graduate fifty thousand dollars in debt and never got your degree. That's really a genuine tragedy. So are you graduating? Are you graduating on time? Or is it taking forever? Could you get the courses you want? Could you major in what you wanted to major in? All that's good. Uh, with regard to employment, do you have skill sets that are valuable in the market? And I have a different view of that. I don't think you should ter teach people to turn bolts. I think the analytic cognitive skills. I don't care if you're a lawyer, or an automobile mechanic, a nurse, a bank teller, a police officer. If you can solve problems and you can communicate and you can synthesize ideas, you're better at whatever it is you were supposed, you, you've chosen to, to, to do in life. So um, we need to push our graduation rates up higher. I would like to see us get the 50% in the Pell um, recipients. Uh, some may, people in the middle class may resent that, but they have more choices than the poor kids. Mm -hmm. So I view us as an opportunity factory for low income students. And I, I want them to have the better shot at it. We want the middle class kids as well. We want everyone, uh, um, but um, uh, the poor, you know, often don't have advisors and the money and the, tr you know, the trips to Rome and the tutors. We need to be able to deal with that and and help those students. More better transfer rates would be another thing. Um, and um, uh, but anyhow, so we will cooperate on that. If it's something simplistic, then you'll see me whine in the newspapers. Well, where do you come down? Where do you come down on the issue of um, freezing student uh, fees for five years in exchange for having uh, increased funding? In my personal opinion, we we're freezing it for two years, and we'll revisit this issue, or my successor will. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's a long-term solution. Uh, if you do the math, and you say, "Well, what's driving up your costs? Why aren't you?" Uh, you know. The major cost driver is uh, pension reform. Uh, two years before the state of California did it, we did pension reform at the University of California. We did a new tier, which has been largely accepted by our employees, but not by five or six of our uh, labor unions. Uh, although the deal we're offering is actually a better deal mm -hmm. than the state of California offered many of those same types of employees. Uh, so our biggest driver is pay. if we didn't have to put a billion dollars a year into pension, it has a sorry history. The university has plenty of fault in this. The legislature has some. But we, we had a 19-year holiday. No employee, no employer contributions on the theory that markets always go up. And um, so uh, that's the biggest driver. And then there, there are other drivers like energy cost and health care cost. And the, it's not, the, you know, our, our highest paid chancellors 44th in salary among the top 60 chancellors in America. Mm. So it's it's not out of control wages and it's not other things that people often think, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, so, that's, so, that's the situation. Um, well, the markets didn't go up when you came here in 2008, that's for sure. Yeah, and I was you shocked. Had to, you, know. <laughs> you had to deal with that. Um, so if you think about the... Um, the goal, the aspiration of the UC system that um, you know, all students who are eligible um, have a chance right. to be in UC. And um, if you think about adding the goal of what you're, ad what you're suggesting with around accountability of graduating in a reasonable amount of time, whatever that might be, four years or five years, um, how difficult is that going to be in the future? Well, I don't know. Today, it's interesting. As the times have gotten harder, the students are graduating in higher numbers. Hmm. So we're, we're down to 4.2 years is our average time of graduation. Hmm. We'd like to drive it down to four. The governor said the other day he wants to d drive it down to three point something. Uh, that would be a major undertaking. It's something we need to think about. Uh, you know, Britain has three-year undergraduate degrees. You would need to look at your high schools. You'd look, need to look at a lot of things. Uh, um, you know, to, to get to, to, to you know to get that um, down. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Is, uh, so a lot of people uh, say that California is ungovernable, and if if you think that California is ungovernable, I mean, how easy is it to govern the UC system, right? You've got the regents, you've got the faculty, you've got the students, and you've got ten campuses, five medical schools. So what, what's the role of the UC president in all of this? And is it well, manageable or uh, not? Uh, no, it's not manageable. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it, it, it is I hard. can see the headlines you're, now. You're, 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 you're sort of a, <laughs> often you're more of a mediator. Yeah. You know, that's one problem. I yeah. mean, you've got 230,000 students. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, 180,000 employees, including faculty, each of whom views himself or herself as a vice president entitled to be fully consulted on every decision. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got students who are all over the place, I mean, of all different opinions, ethnicities, and political perspectives, and so forth. Uh, but it's it's really a great, fun place. I mean, these people are amazingly talented and do fabulous things. Uh, but it is difficult. I would say one of the central issues is um, uh, a federalist type principles. What sorts of things should you do in Oakland at the center? And what sort of things need to be done on campus? And there's some easy things like we, the University of California Press. We only have one at the center. We have a digital library. We only have one at the center. Uh, we set uh, targets on undergraduate enrollment. We do that in the center and then divvy it up by campus. But we can't be in the business of hiring chemistry professors. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, what, what do we know about that in, in the office of the president? We're not any smarter. And in fact, we lead a rather ethereal life, right? We have no blackboards. We have no students. We have no teachers. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's massively dull. Um, and um, <laughs> so... You know, so I would say the federalism issue, and it's, it's a constant source of tension. Mm -hmm. And so what I've tried to do is to make it more transparent. This is what we sent, spent. We, you want a, 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 a new telescope on the, uh, the Mauna Kea in Hawaii, it's a billion dollars, and the Chinese and the Japanese and the Canadians and NSF and all Caltech, they'll all help. But you have to pay for a telescope centrally. So we talk about it among all the chancellors. And then we talk about the other central services and to try to get a sense of mm -hmm. you know, what they can live with, meanwhile trying to drive down the administrative costs. We're down about 500 employees mm -hmm. in the office of the president. How many were there when you came uh, in? About 2,000. Well, the date's not exactly. There were a little over 2,000. Wow. Many of them are not on public money. They're on research money and so forth. Uh, and now it's, I can't remember, it's 1,400, 1,500 now, mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. Uh, so, so the federalism issue is used, and I don't know of any great university that's managed centrally. I mean, I, it just doesn't work. Yeah. You need the faculty and the students. I, and I can't yeah. think of another great public university system that has a Berkeley, a UCLA, a San Diego, you know, right. Davis, schools that are, you know, in, in the top tier in the world. So what do you think about uh, when campuses say, you know, let us set our own uh, uh, tuition or student fees or, or let, well, let, let us set our own course. Set us free, basically. I, I think about it very hard because yeah. I think there's a lot to the local autonomy point. Uh, it obviously is easier for UCLA and for Berkeley to say it than for Vermeer They need a lot of help centrally, and we try to provide that. And by the way, they're doing very well at Merced. Um, so it, I, I always think about it very hard, and I try to view it... Uh, 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 practically and pragmatically. Uh, if you were starting uh, from scratch, would you have a Board of Regents for each campus or would you do it centrally? I think that might be an open question. Mm. Um, but we have a state constitution, we have a Board of Regents. We actually have a very good track record with all these campuses like Santa Barbara and Davis and so forth, Irvine, moving up into the top ranks of American universities. Mm -hmm. But I think we ought not be closed-minded about it. Now, uh, I personally would delegate more of the compensation si decisions to the campuses. Mm -hmm. Tuition, I'm not so sure about. Uh, um, maybe, maybe not. But there's massive public opposition to it. I don't, yeah. I yeah. don't view that as a real option. Right. Right. And, um, uh, and I think uh, you know, the medical centers, uh, we probably need to revamp the governance some. But they have very complicated mm. problems. Um, so, yeah, I, I, um, uh, I, I think all you can do is it's like a permanent revolution, like Jefferson said. You, you never should be so staid and fixed in your ways. When someone says, why can't we do it locally, you ought to think darn hard about it because that may be the best thing to do. Part of the problem is because no matter what happens, the public holds the Board of Regents and me accountable. You know, I didn't decide to play a plastic surgeon somewhere a million dollars a year. Uh, largely out of clinical revenues. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're sitting there, but you're affirming decisions over which you, as a practical matter, have almost no control. 
much less the football coaches and the basketball coaches. And, mm -hmm. well, I tried to get my salary fixed as a percentage of the football coaches, <laughs> uh, but uh, not 100%, work, huh? I might add, just less no. than half, but yeah. it didn't fly. Didn't work. Yeah. So you, you have the unique perspective of not only leading you know, the top public university in the world, but also uh, leading the Texas system and the Minnesota system. So I wonder if you can, from the vantage point of all this experience, um, give us a sense of where we are in this country with higher education today and where do you think it will be in the next decade? It's, it, it, it's interesting. And by the way, I have had an assortment of gover governors that I will compare with anyone's. If anyone can do better than Jesse Ventura, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jerry Brown, Rick Perry, and George Bush, I'll eat my hat. So <laughs> I may do my tell-all yeah. book with one chapter each <laughs> on the unusual governors I have known. And Good. In, Good. In, 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 interacted with them. And, and I I'd mean, like it's it all on. deference to our present governor. Yeah. They're all weird in their own way. Uh, <laughs> um, I want an autographed copy of that book. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, so I think I've lost track of the question. Where are we going? Where are we um, going? Uh, well, I'm where are disturbed. We where are we this going? is what I was getting into this talk about. We don't assume the worthwhileness. I see governors in a number of states like Pennsylvania and North Carolina and Texas and other states where they're raising all those tough questions and they don't seem to have a natural affinity. And, and you usually look to a governor to protect the great public universities because by definition the legislature is balkanized you know if you don't have a campus in your district how you feel about it and all that stuff so i'm worried about that and i don't know where it's going but i see it as a demographic problem hmm. we spent the highest proportion of our uh, gmp on education period you know probably you would know hans but in the, maybe by 1962 or something like that and now aging population has the priorities of an aging population and um, so I'm worried about it and I think we'll be pushed very hard to change the delivery system models but I don't want the university saddled with the Wang computers mm -hmm. uh, or in my case a Commodore 64 which I thought was going to work well but <laughs> never figured out what to do with it um, <laughs> and um, so but I, my guess is the people will have the type of educational system they want and deserve mm -hmm. So I would say 10 years from now, I think you'll see a lot more e-learning because the students and faculty and parents and so forth will be more comfortable with it mm -hmm. and it'll be increasingly uh, high quality. It won't be all of it. I don't think most parents will say, Johnny, go to your room for four years, see you later. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it will always be a market for people who <laughs> want to be on campus and interact with peers and do, do other things. So I, uh, I, I think that'll change. I think the degree structure may well change. Hmm. I heard a very prominent business school dean saying he wasn't sure the MBA's degrees would be around for that long, but hmm. maybe a one-year certificate programs, and you get a certificate in whatever, in, in finance or entrepreneurship or something, that we have a very ancient degree structure. Uh, it takes a long time to get a medical degree, a law degree. Um, I could see that changing. Mm -hmm. uh, I could see the concept of a major changing always seemed to me a little odd that people who had no desire to be sociologists or anthropologists or whatever were, were taking a, a series of courses as if they were all going to graduate school in those areas. I don't know why it's not acceptable to mm -hmm. have a, a, you know, area requirements, you know, whatever the faculty and mm -hmm. so forth think would be worthwhile. I think that could change. So I think there'd be profound changes, but uh, they're not wholly predictable. And what makes it hard is you don't know what the horse what yeah. horse to bet on today. Right, right. It's very hard to know. Yeah. So, well, you have been um, speaking a lot about the value of public higher edu education and also the, the trends that, um, that, that you're seeing that lead you to think that we need a new higher education compact. Mm -hmm. uh, we, as an institution, have been raising awareness about what we see as a coming trouble around the fact that we don't have enough college educated workers to meet the demands of the economy in the future. Um, how do you think, if you listen to Hans's $1 million, $1 million, $1 million uh, uh, projection uh, of uh, the shortage of college educated workers, how should we as a state try to deal with that? It's a very tough issue. And 
and I don't know Hans's view. I'm on the Lumina Foundation board, and this is their big goal to have, I can't remember, 60% uh, high quality certificates and degrees and people in the relevant age bracket by 2025, something like that. And the progress nationally is minuscule. In fact, I ha hasten to say it's within the range of random variation. Hmm. I mean, you, I wouldn't take these numbers to the bank. They're going up a little bit, but whether, and even if it's not random, it, mm -hmm. it will never get there at the current rate of an improvement. So what do we do? Um, well, I, 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 you know, I mean, it's easy for me to say, like Hans said. I mean, I think, actually, I agree with most of the things that he, that he was saying. Um, it probably requires more money, mm. and there are a lot of contenders for that. Um, but it's hard to grow the university 30,000 students if you're going to keep cutting our budget. Um, and so I, I, I think we need accountability. I think for too long, state governments and the feds have had a blank check. Mm -hmm. I think you need better financial aid because the middle class is really getting squeezed in this country. In some sort of system where it's almost like Social Security, you go for free. And, you know, five years from graduation, you're driving a cab, you get loan forgiveness or you're at least delayed. If you had a hedge fund, we really sock it to you. Um, so I think that's another element uh, of it. I don't think we have a good understanding of how to educate poor kids. I know mm. it's not fashionable to say that, but in all these efforts I see, they're very rah-rah and -rah on the ground and so forth. But actually, a, how it is children learn. I mean, we have some insights. We know you're better off taking Algebra two than not taking Algebra two if you want to go to college. Uh, we know that kids on campus uh, seem to do better than kids who commute. Below the, it's not clear what the independent variable is. Mm -hmm. And we could go on and on. So I think we need some very deep research about how you, uh, how you, how you get these, uh, these outcomes. And I'm very practical about it. Someone once said, are you a whole language or a phonetics advocate when it comes to language instruction? And my answer was, I don't care if they're on one foot, standing on one foot what works for a particular child or a particular group of children. Mm -hmm. And I think we don't know enough about what works. Mm -hmm. With all our razzle-dazzle uh, technology, we still mm -hmm. don't know what, what will enable and facilitate a young person who maybe has uh, had a, you know, a poverty background to, mm -hmm. to enable them to mm -hmm. succeed. Um, uh, and so I, I think some more money and more accountability for the outcomes more e-learning, that is a pathway. Mm -hmm. I've suggested, and my colleagues have not uh, embraced it with any alacrity, that uh, in addition to transfer from community college, it should be possible for some of the students not admitted to the University of California to take a year online of specified mm -hmm. courses by University of California professors and then to transfer to the university. And that, you know, that could reach a lot of young people. And, idea. you know, again, you have to worry about the social class yeah. effects. Do, do all groups have access to the computers and so forth? But so you'd have to, and you'd have to have financial aid, but the, the, you, you could work those things okay. through. Well, that's interesting. So within the last year, we've had um, leadership change at the top at the community college system of California, which has the most students of all. And then the Cal State system, which has lot more students than the UC uh, uh, system. Um, and I'm wondering, um, I'm sure you've told them privately what your advice is, but what you, can you tell us about what you've told them about your advice going into those leadership positions, having been now the person who's got the most experience? Well, I didn't, I didn't tell Bryce much about the community college system. I mean, I, I had actually never met him, and hmm. I've been very impressed, and I've been depressed that we cut 400,000 kids out of the community college system and then wonder why more of them aren't going on to four-year degrees and all that. Uh, I mean, this is a calamity and it's got to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And it's the bedrock of the master plan in California. Um, so I've just been supportive. I haven't had any special insights. Mm -hmm. uh, the community college system governance is probably more complex than the University of California, if that's possible. Um, Cal State, I told Tim not to take the job. <laughs> okay. Uh, I and said, Tim, this is an impossible job. Mm -hmm. uh, but if there's anyone who could do it, you're probably the guy. I mean, <laughs> you know, Tim is a great success story. You know, he was born in South America and pulls himself up by his bootstraps, ends up with a PhD, teaches at Berkeley, and 
heads various universities. I mean, it's a wonderful story of a very compassionate, intelligent man with a great deal of sensitivity to the types of students that CSU serves. Uh, but it's very difficult. They keep cutting the budget and uh, uh, there aren't, isn't enough money for all the sections that you need and um, they need to work hard on the graduation rate and that's not easy. Um, and uh, I don't know if I told them any, anything beyond that. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's your job when you head these institutions to stand up and defend them yeah. without being overly defensive about it. Right, right. And as you look about back at the last uh, five years that you've led the UC system, uh, what do you consider your biggest accomplishments and what's still a work in progress for the next person? Well, I would say um, the blue and gold program, you know, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but if, uh, if you have, family, you, uh, mention if you have family income of $80,000 a year or less, you don't pay any tuition. Hmm. And that's not your only financial aid. You can get some above that. Again, squeezes the middle class, but I go into the, so that's an accomplishment. Okay. And I've gone into the high schools, Grant hmm. High School, and I've gone to you know, uh, Roosevelt High School, I'm going to Oakland Tech, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you know, I can sell it. Uh, I can stand up and say, work hard, listen to your teachers, listen to your parents. Mm -hmm. um, it's not complicated. Just ask your mom and dad to look at their tax return. If it's under $80,000 and you get admitted, we got you covered. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that was good. A lot of stuff the public doesn't see. I mean, it was, in my opinion, not a very well managed um, uh, office of the president when I arrived. So there's no reason that, you know, you know, so we've cut the cell phone expenses in half and we uh, put in common IT systems, mm. which we really didn't have, and budget systems, and you know where the money comes from and what the accounts, what's in the accounts. We've restructured the debt. We've saved over $400 million mm. uh, having better management of our balance sheet because the University of California can issue bonds. In fact, our, our credit rating is higher than the state of California. At one time or another, we've loaned the state as much as a billion dollars. And thank God they paid it back because <laughs> it's pretty hard to garnish their wages and seize their desks and stuff like that. Um, what was the hardest decision you had to make? I think the furloughs, which I did in the first year, were, was a very hard decision. Mm. And it's very hard to do in a fair way. Yeah. So it was the only furloughs that didn't, didn't get much ink. You know, all the other furloughs, is everybody's furloughed for so many days a month. Mm -hmm. So I thought that's really unfair. Uh, we should do it progressively. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, if you, I can't remember exactly, but say if you made under $40,000, you, you returned 4% of your salary. If you made over 200,000, you returned 10%. Mm -hmm. So it was progressive. Uh, legislature liked that, but mm -hmm. the, the general population wasn't aware of that. But then it's riddled with exceptions. First thing the Department of Energy writes me and says, you can't furlough the people at our lab at Lawrence Berkeley. That's our budget. Mm. So I had to take them out. And mm. then there were research budgets and a lot of people not on state money. You know, very complicated. I would say that was a very, very hard decision. Uh, I think some of the... Um, without getting into the details, the, uh, the uh, decisions on chancellors in terms of mm. who stays and who, mm -hmm. who, who, who you're in. That's uh, gotta be hard. Uh, um, I've now appointed six chancellors, including an acting chancellor, mm. uh, uh, four women, one Indian American, and one anthropologist. Mm. I'm a little worried about the anthropologist, to be honest <laughs> with you, but that's Nick Dirks at yeah, Berkeley. Yeah, but I think yeah. he's probably okay. It should be all right. I think it'll work Anti -colonialist out. Anti-colonialist studies, India should be okay. Um, and um, th those were hard decisions. Some of the personnel decisions are very hard. Um, I don't know. I have to think about it some more. It's, I know uh, that it's uh, it's typical when a president leaves and one comes in that they they leave a note. Nobody knows exactly what's on that note. I got such a note from the past president of PPIC with some advice uh, going out. Um, what are the kinds of issues that would be on your note? to the next UC president? Uh, yeah. I could write, just look for money. That would be. <laughs> that, that would be. Look somewhere in your office yeah, for money uh, or, or, uh, or further out or there? 983 days to retirement <laughs> or something like that. Um, well, I, you know, I sort of knew intellectually, but not in my um, gut that you, you touched on it before. Given the complicated nature of the job, you're really always at risk if you simply go off, uh, get aboard your 
white horse and mm -hmm. you know have your lance there and, and your armor on. Um, you know, you, you have to spend a lot of time lining up the various constituencies. Yeah. And uh, that may be a call to Governor Brown or to the legislative leaders, meeting with the academic council or faculty governance, meeting internally. Yeah. I mean, I have found, I mean, it's just true that I have to spend time even persuading mid-level people mm -hmm. in the office of the president mm -hmm. because they can delay your programs by years sure. if, if, if they're really out yeah. of sync with it. Yeah. So it's, it's very time consuming and sometimes frustrating. And, and the good side is, is a lot of times it turns out you had a really bad idea or right. it turns out that you should modify what you were planning to do. But even if you're right, I mean, my, what I tell my staff is that um, being right is only 10% of the problem. I, th I think President Obama would agree with that. 90% mm -hmm. of it is selling it to the people who you need to bring on board to get it done. And, um, and, and that's what a president does. We've got 24 members of the Board of Regents and um, they're very important and they've been very nonpartisan and very supportive. Uh, but uh, you can't get out ahead of them too much. You need to keep people abreast of things. Well, as I've told you many times when we've had uh, lunch together over the last five years, um, the state's been lucky to have you. And well, I'm glad you came. Kind. I'm looking forward to going back to law professoring. I, one of my few skill sets is oppressing law students. I do it <laughs> very well. Uh, enjoy it. Good. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to ask you some more about that. your plans uh, if I have a chance to. Um, but thank you. And let's see if there are any questions uh, from our audience. Yes. A lot of stories now that they're on a path that cannot be maintained mm. with the facilities that they have to do for recruiting, for the salaries that are out of sight for coaching and all of that, that sort of sends a terrible message that, like you say, you can't compete with your salary <laughs> with the coach's salary. And so I'd like to hear your comments about how that plays in higher education at this point. I don't know what to do about the athletics thing, but I, I'm, I have, I mean, I love athletics, and I love watching young people compete, and the alums enjoy it, and, you know, it, it, it's healthy. But um, uh, I think we're at a very difficult point. I mean, there are only uh, probably two dozen, maybe less, athletic programs in America that break even. Hmm. And, uh, the, and uh, you know, in most places, the football team is carrying almost everything else. And Title IX has been fabulous. I mean, I'm a 100% supporter. I, I, I advocated for it, uh, for women's athletics, but very, nearly all men's sports lose money and nearly all women's sports lose money. So it's added to the, to the deficit. And then this, this craziness that you have to build halls of fame and pay $5 million salaries and all that. Um, when I was in the Big Ten um, Council, I, uh, I was so angry about it. I, but maybe we could agree to tamp some of these things down. We called in an antitrust expert. He informed me I would go to jail for price fixing and the like. I decided to abandon the effort at that point. Good idea. Um, so I, I don't know what to do about it, but I do think, uh, and, and uh, the NCAA is, it tries its best, but this is, I, I don't know the answer. I share your dissatisfaction, but it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to know exactly what the answer is. I mean, and there are other things which you didn't mention. I mean. So many people will go to uh, a uh, first-class football or basketball program and they'll stay a year and they'll leave the university. Many people think they're going to make the pros and get the big paycheck, and they don't because a very small percentage of all athletes do. Uh, I mean, there, there are enormous problems. And so I agree with some of your comments. I, I just don't know how to fix it. Mm. Um, Tough question. Tough question. Over here. Mm. Oh, we have to hold the microphone because we're being recorded. Yeah, my name is Ralph Spinelli. I am presently a PhD student at the Goldman School at the University of California, Berkeley. My focus of study is criminal justice, uh, and I have a difficult time bifurcating uh, the criminal aspect with education because there's a direct tie in my research has shown me. I just finished. Uh, uh, excuse me, but can we get to the question? Because we have limited time. Question, please. Now, the question is, uh, there's a reason that, that uh, the CCPOA gets a lot more attention than the California Teachers Association does. And 
uh, you know, money is not the total answer. I mean, just throwing money at everything is not the answer. I think that was kind of a question. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I don't remember um, Governor Schwarzenegger had a proposal that was never even introduced, mm -hmm. that you could never spend more money on the prisons than on education, higher education. And um, yeah. I, I mean, I can get into the reasons. Part of it is it's, it's legally driven, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I last saw Governor Brown, there was all this uh, contratops around the court's orders and That's who would right. be held in contempt and so forth. So uh, there's that. There's the fear of, uh, which I understand, of, uh, of legislatures legislators of being uh, perceived as being soft yeah. on crime and letting people out of the prisons. Uh, but it's unbelievable. When I, first time I spoke to Governor Brown, I mean, if you look to the Governor Brown's budgets in the 70s, it was whatever. We had six, seven percent or eight percent, something like that of the budget in prisons were three. Yeah. Now it's completely flipped. And yeah. uh, we're now spending more money on the bad guys than on our own children. I mean, and that is unbelievable. It seems like nobody uh, feels vulnerable about being soft on higher education, huh? Not like soft. Well, on apparently higher. you don't lose elections by being soft on higher ed, and yeah. letting the bad guys out of prison can be hurtful. There's a question right in the middle here. Yes. I'd be interested in what your oh hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested in what your note would be to an incoming student to the University of California. <laughs> okay, I would say, um, you know, I'm a parent too, so I'm full of advice. Um, <laughs> And uh, I would say it's, um, you've chosen a great university. I would say study would interest you. You don't have to listen to all those elders telling you what to study. And, you know, and they'll tell you the real money's in gravel or something, but they don't really know. So you might as well study what you like because you don't know what life is like. Pick the professors that seem to be great, great teachers and interest you. I would say, um, Make sure you graduate in four years. I mean, there's no reason to be out of the labor market and so forth or not go to graduate school. Uh, and then I'd say two important things. Um, uh, I always tell them this. Make sure you call your parents at least once a week. Uh, they're some of the few people who really understand you and can nurture you. And, uh, and find your subset, hopefully not a criminal class, in, in the university, and you know, if you're interested in real estate or you want to belong to an ethnic studies group or, you know, it's, a, I don't know, the skiing or bicycling club, universities are large. It's very important to come up with a subset of people who maybe share some of your interest or your outlook. And because ultimately you have to have a sense of belonging and community. I mean, the other stuff is obvious, you have to study hard and so forth, but to, if, if you're not attentive to the social side of your life, you're not gonna do well either. Good advice. Question on this side, yes. Hi, I'm wondering, um, I'm going back to a comment that Hans made, which is he talked a little bit about the state having a set of goals, and I'm wondering why um, UC hasn't actually taken a position of kind of starting that conversation. It seems to me that you have a fairly esteemed place in terms of being able to play a leadership role in helping the state to articulate both a set of goals in, in terms of degree attainment and how all of the university systems and college systems might be able to go about um, articulating that on behalf of students and on behalf of the state. And I'm wondering if you think that might be something that might be on your successor's agenda. Yeah, I, I think that's on our, our, on our laundry list. And in fact, we have, and we, I don't know what the right methodology is. We have been pushing the Department of Finance and, and meeting with legislators for a couple of years now to, to set um, things like graduation rate goals. Uh, we proposed, uh, Chris Edley and I, Chris is dean of the law school at Berkeley, that um, before you, you actually get your Pell money, you have to meet certain uh, goals of enrolling low-income students. And, uh, so, so we've done that. Maybe we should have just adopted it at a board meeting. We haven't done that, uh, but we may do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we probably could have done better, actually. Um, uh, but I think what's going to happen is we're going to have an iterative process with the legislature, and you'll see the goals emerge. The other thing is um, currently the state doesn't want to pay for it. I mean, I'd like to announce a goal of 20,000 more students and and even higher graduation rates. We have some of the highest in the country for a public university. Um, but they, they want the goals, but not the wherewithal to get there. So um, we'd be happy to take, um, and maybe we should take more of a lead, but that's been on the table for a long time. It's just not the type of thing where I've held a press conference and said, mm. this is the goal. I'd like to come back to uh, 
sorry, the uh, question about what you're going to do next, because um, what a UC president does next is, of course, of great interest to all of us. Um, and um, I know that you're going to go to Berkeley and you will have a sabbatical there. Um, but how are you thinking about research, teaching, service, any future plans? Well, remember what Ronald Reagan said that people said hard work never killed anyone. <laughs> Uh, President Reagan said, why take the chance? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, and um, so I have that in mind, but um, uh, I, um, I don't know. You know, historically, I've taught constitutional law and contracts and educational policy in the law. I've taught the First Amendment. So you may see some teaching in those areas, which I have a historical um, commitment to. have a case book in one of those areas. Um, I have an invitation. Uh, with regard to the Goldman School, I really enjoy public policy. Good. Uh, so I could end up teaching a course there. There's my tell-all book on the governors. Um, <laughs> I like and, that. Uh, and and um, I, I, I mainly, I think, writing. I, I don't want to, uh, I'll probably serve on, a, I'm on a couple of boards, nothing too fancy. Um, that, that's sort of my plan at the moment. I hope that your plans include continuing to have lunch with me on a periodic basis because, Be you know, as long I've, as you pick up the tab, I will pick you. up the tab. <laughs> I've always enjoyed talking to you and, and that, that includes as the highlight of talking to you, you being here today for oh, all of us. You. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoyed it. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. I also want to thank Kim and Hans for being part of the program Thank with you. Mark, and uh, all of our sponsors who made this possible, and please fill out your evaluation surveys, and please join us for, uh, for our reception, and Mark, if you, in, uh, if you can stay a little while, I'm sure folks will have questions that they'll want to continue, but thank you very much for being here today.